Welcome to the Geisland Podcast. I'm Mitch Van Acker. Today I'm talking with Professor Declan Kyberg. Declan is widely considered to be one of Ireland's greatest living critics. He's had an illustrious career teaching at the University of Kent, Trinity College Dublin, University College Dublin, and Notre Dame. He's a frequent contributor to the Irish Times and has authored many books concerning Irish literature and culture. Declan has also emerged globally as one of the leading commentators on the work of Irish writer James Joyce. The main subject of our talk today is James Joyce's masterwork, Ulysses, an experimental novel following Leopold Bloom, a half-Jewish ad man, as he goes about his day in Dublin on June 16, 1904. Declan and I touch on a host of other topics, including censorship, sex and religion, pacifism, the music of the late 60s, the epic as a form, and the role of technology on society, art, and education, among other things. I would also like to add that I consider Declan to be a great personal friend. He's had a tremendous influence over my life and thinking, and has shown me a level of kindness and generosity that I hope one day I'll have the chance to repay. Okay, we're off. So I am here with Declan Kybird. Um, I'm going over some of the things in the um, introduction, but uh, Declan, if you just want to introduce yourself to the audience and give us a quick background of um, your own life and your own interest in Joyce, that'd be great. Um, well, I've spent most of my life teaching Irish literature here in Dublin at University College Dublin. But the last 10 years, I taught at the University of Notre Dame, which is one of the epicenters of Irish studies in the US. Um, I got very interested in literature. Obviously, it's one of the strengths of Irish culture. I mean, we, we, we export Guinness, we used to export priests, and we certainly export lots of great writers. Um, and I found them a way of understanding, I suppose, just the country's own self-imaging. Uh, for instance, the last national banknotes we had before we got those horrible Stalinist uh, Euro notes that we now <laughs> use, they actually featured Irish writers. Um, and I thought that was interesting. Most people's currencies in other countries had political figures on the banknotes or even on the stamping system but this country turned to writers uh, for a self-explanation. I think there's a reason uh, we had a civil war which was very divisive. So a lot of politicians who might have gone on the notes could have created a bit of trouble. But um, I think it's also to do with the fact that people are happy at the idea that we are a literary culture and we produce a hell of a lot of writing. It, it, uh, to me, words are the weapons of the disarmed they are something we used during the colonial period to, if you like, write back, as in the empire writes back. Um, and also they're not expensive, you know, the, the visual and plastic arts required a certain affluence to practice, but anyone with a pen and paper could embrace the world of literature. So to me, it was a, a, an act of, if you like, anti-colonial, um, not propaganda, but counterstatement, and 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 also a, an alternative to violence. Really, um, Alice Walker, the great African American writer, once said that that to her writing was an alternative to the sin of violence. And I think, for people like Seamus Heaney, that was also true. I mean, he he grew up in a Northern Ireland riven with sectarian hatred. He could very easily have been recruited into the IRA, but he chose instead to make his statements in poetry. So wonderful. Um, the the particular uh, writer that sort of brought us together um, was James Joyce, and Joyce has been a huge part of your career, obviously. And um, so, take us through kind of your life story, um, as summary as you can, in encountering Joyce and having your ideas 
evolve along with a lifelong reading of Joyce's work? Well, uh, my father kept a few kind of <clears throat> contraband books in a wardrobe in the house that I grew up in. One of them was the Kinsey Report on Sexuality, but another was James Joyce's Ulysses. So I deduced in my mid-teens that these books must contain forbidden and interesting material. I remember trying to read through Ulysses and being deeply disappointed. I couldn't find much of it. It was, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was a bit like um, uh, when I first listened to Bob Dylan's Blonde on Blonde and realized this is great stuff. I'm not sure what it's saying. It's coming from a planet that I have not yet established on any heavenly map, but I'll keep listening. And what happened in my case was while I was a student in Trinity College, Dublin, a terrible killing occurred in Northern Ireland in which 13, really 14, if you count the baby of a pregnant mother, people were murdered by the British Army on a perfectly peaceful civil rights march. And this links to my earlier point that Joyce to me is the supreme pacifist, unlike many exponents of Epic, who of course promoted the martial arts and military thinking. Um, Joy Joyce was attracted by Homer's Odysseus because he was a draft dodger. He didn't want to go to the war. And Joyce himself, I think, created in Bloom uh, a figure who is deeply suspicious of soldiers and militarism, who says it's madness, for instance, to arm soldiers in the face of a civilian demonstration. So I, having just witnessed all these terrible events in Northern Ireland on my TV set, and then free for a week because classes were canceled uh, the week afterwards. Uh, that was the way in which I first read Ulysses, constantly on the lookout for, if you like, pacific values, which Joyce was bringing to the fore. And uh, we know he could have chosen Cúchulain rather than Odysseus as the model for an Irish epic, but Cúchulain was associated with a kind of glamorized cult of violence promoted by people like W.B. Yeats, indeed, in his plays, and like Lady Gregory in her Cúchulain of Wiltemna book. Uh, but Joyce just chose the, the Greek figure for, for the reasons I'm hinting at. So Bloom is a character in James Joyce's Ulysses. Um, and we, so take us through kind of the character of Leopold Bloom and what, what are some examples of that pacific um, impulse that Joyce was trying to record? Well, um, the beginning of Bloom's day, he makes his wife her breakfast and gives it, his wife her breakfast in bed, which, you know, might be quite commonplace nowadays among liberated men and women. But in the Dublin of 1904, as my father told me, was an act tantamount to perversion. Um, and, and, and of course, uh, Bloom is almost sacramental in the way he prepares the food. Very careful, rigorous, um, thoughtful. Most Irish people, even today, gulp down their food. And this is a sort of post reaction to the Irish famine and to the scarcity of food, um, which led many people to grab what little there was. But Bloom's attitude is completely reverential and sacramental. And the fact that he is willing to, in a way, be ordered by his wife in the disposition of the food is itself the start of the passivity he shows all through the book. Um, he seems to me to be a remarkably um, kind of suffering person, if you like, or at least someone, um, you, you know, Hemingway distinguished those who do and those to whom things are done as figures in modern literature. And I think Bloom is one of those to whom things are done. So uh, it, it really begins in that way. And I found it fascinating because um, th there's a slightly foreign element in him, which may be linked with his semi-Jewishness. Uh, many Irish people find it degrading, actually, to wait on other people. Jobs as waiters, for instance, are advertised at present all over Dublin. And most of these pre-COVID were done by incomers from France or Romania, Africa, wherever. I remember my father saying that, you know, Irish people found it almost demeaning to, to, to serve food to others. But this is the first thing we see Bloom doing. So 
and, and he takes a kind of pride in it and in the fact that it's done well, which contrasts utterly with the slapdash approach to food taken in the opening chapter of the book by the three young men, Stephen uh, Haynes and Mulligan, who kind of eat the food with a certain resentment, especially resentment at the fact that there isn't a woman to serve it to them. And all through the book after that, Bloom shows these kind of um, gentle Pacific qualities. For instance, at lunchtime, he could go into a restaurant and eat some meat, but he is nauseated at the sight of lots of men gulping back the meat, and he prefers instead to have a, a glass of burgundy and eat some cheese. And um, I think there's kind of, um, um, Joyce once said, if you really want to understand a person, their attitude to how they deal with food tells you more than how they would go to war. And uh, I think that's, that's part of his portrayal of Bloom. Bloom, for instance, distributes bread to the seagulls who fly over the river Liffey. And this, in a way, is a kind of Eucharist. All through the book, you know, food is being distributed in almost sacramental ways. And the whole thing ends, in fact, uh, when we have a reminiscence of Bloom's first moment with his wife-to-be, Molly. And she, lying on top of him, passes seed cake from her own mouth into his, literally inseminates the man, inseminates him in a kind of brilliant androgynous reversal. But, but, but again, it's to do with the Eucharistic moment, the sharing of food. And it's been preceded by that moment when Bloom, who has kindly extricated the student, Stephen Dedalus, from the wiles of a, a brothel madame uh, and, and saved Stephen his money and everything else, offers him um, coffee and a bun, which again is an equivalent of the Eucharist. I've always thought that, um, the uh, that, that Joyce was in fact trying not so much to rebel against the images of Catholicism as to uh, uh, rediscover their value in a non institutional form, and that's also true of Proust, you know, as a key Eucharistic moment when the Madeleine, uh, when the Madeleine is dipped in the tea. I think the uh, surrealists in Paris. Many of them were lapsed Catholics, but most of them adopted the negative aspects of Catholicism. You know, it's edicts, it's excommunications, uh, especially in extreme forms of Trotskyism to which some of them lapsed. But, but, but Joyce is taking this celebratory, you know, he takes this single day of the year, which is of course something that the Catholic religion does with its notion of the, fe the feast day. And, and Bloom's day, the 16th of June, it has its, special rituals, its special walks, its particular foods, just like a feast day would in a religious cult. So it's as if Joyce is kind of mimicking in a way that, that very Catholicism, which most people say he was in rebellion against. Yeah, so for anybody listening that hasn't read Ulysses, you're probably getting the sense that um, it is very heavily focused on just the sheer, um, I guess we'd say, minutia of the day. Well, well, I think the day is the unit to be seized. Yes. Carpe diem. Joyce mm -hmm. understands that. And he also understands that the ordinariness of the average day is the central element of our lives. Um, he once said the ordinary is the proper domain of the writer. The extraordinary can safely be left to journalists. And he was writing in an age of sensation journalism, when also it was technically possible for the first time, just in recent decades, to render the news of the previous 24 hours. You know, in the mid 19th century and earlier, you had to cover a much wider span in a printed periodical or newspaper. But in Joyce's time, they could just report the previous day's events. And he is producing, in my mind, a kind of counter newspaper purged of all the sensationalism, which newspaper editors relied on to sell their material. And, and, and also, in a way, he's purging epic of its violent sensationalism, because so many of the ancient epics are about, you know, figures in war, in battle. 
And usually in them, there's a 16 line riff where the figure about to go into battle thinks lovingly of his wife or his girlfriend or of a moment when they kissed in a cornfield, the ordinary. And, and what Joyce has simply done is turn all that inside out rather than, you know, the violence of World War I, which was happening in the background as he wrote, he almost doesn't notice it at all. What he is rendering is the moment in the cornfield, the everyday. And this is partly because he's an Irish man coming out of the terrible concussion of 19th century Irish history, which was one long sequence of insurrections, injustices, battles, violence, denial. So that when he describes Bloom early on drinking a cup of tea, it's almost like tea drinking is a revolutionary act. The banalness, the banality of just doing that rather than doing wild, violent things. And I think this is why the book is a celebration of the ordinary. It should also be said, though, it's a celebration of the way ordinary men and women are just as capable of complex thought self-analysis and, um, if you like, cerebration as the so-called upper classes. If you think about it, that kind of interior monologue that Bloom and his wife Molly and Stephen Dedalus have all through the book uh, was something that was considered really only possible to aristocrats, like, say, Prince Andre going into battle in Tolstoy's War and Peace, or if you think about Hamlet and Shakespeare's play, you know, the solilo soliloquies and interior monologues, which are soliloquies, are given to people of upper class. But suddenly Joyce is revolutionary because he's showing the ordinary man and woman is just as capable of all this subtlety and depth of thought. So I think of the book as a great democratic revolution in the evolution of literature. You know, um, it really goes back to the story of Jesus because Jesus made ordinary fishermen and prostitutes, ordinary folk. He made them extraordinary and they were rendered so in the New Testament. But it literally took most kind of, you know, elite literature, 2000 years to catch up with these intuitions and to show the innate dignity of ordinary people going about their day. And that again is why I feel that Joyce is not by any means anti-religion. He's very critical of the Catholic Church as a repressive institution, which exists alongside the colonial repression in Ireland. But his attitude to life, I think, is in many ways very religious and, and, and um, you know, tender. Uh, but it is a celebration of ordinary people and how extraordinary they are when looked at up close. Great. And this offer is a, a good segue into the, your uh, recent project surrounding Ulysses and bringing a lot of interesting and talented people together. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, well, a friend of mine who is a wonderful translator of Joyce into Italian and a former student of mine, Enrico Terranoni, he and I thought that Joyce studies had become over obsessed with, you know, style, technique, and even, you know, <laughs> the consciousness of Stephen, etc. cetera. I, I can explain this to you in one sense. I was listening to uh, a radio broadcast of Ulysses with my dad in 1982. It was a wonderful broadcast. It went on for 36 hours and we tuned in and out. But at one point he looked at me when he was listening to one of Bloom's interior monologues. And he said to me, uh, do you not think it might be better not to have quite so rich an inner life? And I agreed with him and I said, but the reason Irish people have that is because the world around them was one of denial. They didn't own the buildings. They were denied wealth and affluence. They were driven back inside, I suppose, uh, their own heads. Um, so I, 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 I think this is part of what we were thinking. But Enrico and I decided that Joyce studies had become over dominated by people obsessed with questions of style, you know, how inter subjective consciousness of the characters melds. We wanted to show that the book is about life, about subjects, about disciplines, ordinary things. 
So we thought that it would be good to get a person who was expert, not in Joyce, but in the particular subject centralized in each of the 18 episodes to reread, or in some cases read for the first time the book and say what they thought of how their subject was displayed and explored. For instance, I asked an, a woman named Rona Mahoney, who was master for a good while of the maternity hospital here in Dublin to talk about the Oxen of the Sun chapter in which there is a debate which still goes on here in Ireland about whether when it's a toss up between the life of the mother or the life of a child in a difficult medical situation, which life should be privileged. Now in Joyce's time, the Catholic church taught that the child should live and the mother should die. Something in fact, Stephen Dedalus in the book agrees with and something which I think Rona Mahoney now would certainly not agree with and has been involved in many controversies here to make that point. But I invited people like that to engage with the issues raised in each chapter in which they had expertise. Joe O'Connor, who is uh, himself a fine writer and often writes uh, novels structured around ballads and is the brother of Sinead O'Connor, the singer, he wrote about the Sirens chapter, which is all about music. And uh, he called it Sergeant Joyce's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I asked Marina Carr, who is our leading female playwright, maybe our leading playwright full stop, uh, to do a piece on Molly Bloom's soliloquy at the end of the book, which is of course, one of those elements in the book that made it notorious stroke famous as a possibly obscene masterpiece. And she wrote basically a letter to Joyce complaining on behalf of women about the ways in which she felt they had been misrepresented by this soliloquy, which most male readers of the book considered, and some women too, a great breakthrough in the time of its publication in 1922. And then she wrote Joyce's answer to justify what he had done and how he had represented woman as this androgynous being who inseminated her own future husband with the seed cake, etc., who believed there should be women priests and who in general is a woman of uncompromising attitudes who do, does not necessarily believe that the things men want sexually are the things that women necessarily want in sex. So there's a sense in which the book we produced and it's called the book about everything is each chapter is written by someone who knows a lot about the topic at hand. Lara Marlowe, who worked for most of her life in the Irish Times and earlier for 60 Minutes, the American TV documentary program, she wrote about the Aeolus chapter, which is about a newspaper and how it's produced. And as I said to you, I think of Ulysses as a counter newspaper. You know, each takes the day as a unit, but Joyce is taking drinking tea as the central act not reporting on the war in Japan or whatever. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because people will probably read more words in the next three weeks than proportionally speaking in all of written history. And people seem to be worried about people not reading when really they're reading a lot, but they're reading in a place that's mediated by very provocative visuals and pieces that reflect themselves and reflect their own biases and it, it has incredible promise for democratizing knowledge but at the same time the way these things disseminate that knowledge the way they're they're built to increase engagement by presenting an online version of the world and people's roles in it where all their perspectives are reinforced i think it makes a sort of solipsistic picture of the world where the content of the world is shaped by people's desires and it's sort of leading towards a mass solicism that Joyce would have hated. I mean, the unwillingness to meet the strange and sometimes uncomfortable situations of actually physically being in a place in a city when you're seeking knowledge, you're seeking experience. It's very different than sitting in your room and getting a curated version of the world. That's probably more pre pleasing to your own pre prejudices and, something that makes you a sort of voyeur to your own life when you can be hermetically sealed off from 
the world, which is, it strikes me as something that Joyce would have hated because because I think that Joyce's fixation with the sort of simple but very meaningful discomforts of the city sort of make it makes the point that those things that are seemingly small are actually connecting us to the world and to each other. You know, it's almost as if um, we've taken the agency of direct experience out of the equation and we're yeah. just adrift in our own minds. Yeah, there's no doubt that technology has damaged and coarsened, as I said, the quality of thought. But this began in a way with mass literacy. Um, you know, D.H. Lawrence once said that in the long run, the fact that everyone is able to read is going to debase the quality of reading itself. Now, in one way, that sounds like horribly, you know, aristocratic or anti-democratic statement. But in a way, he was right. Um, uh, reading became glib when everyone could do it. And, you know, Bloom sits on the toilet and he reads Titbits magazine. And he thinks, my God, I could do that. It's easy payment at the rate of a guinea a column, you know, a guinea for each time he shits, so to speak. Joyce is mocking the equation between popular literary culture and, if you like, the act of shitting on the toilet. Mm -hmm. And this is because he believed in slow reading in the same way that people nowadays are going back to the idea of slow cooking or slow food. Um, that everything was being rushed too much by modernity. The rush into modernity was itself anti-thought and anti-culture. And, and if, you, if you look at Ulysses, he is constantly, even though it's a big book, he's constantly trying to slow down the act of the reader in reading. For instance, he will put in the same sentence the word bulb, B-U-L-B, and the word blub, B-L-U-B. And you, your eye has to kind of blink and look twice and reread the sentence in order to get it. And, uh, you know, he has all kinds of tricks, like when one once meets someone who once wants, well, uh, to slow the reader down and say, huh, did he write that that way? Um, and I do think it's like Carlos Williams flooding the poems he wrote with white space on a largely empty page in order to try to get people to take the act of reading as something intense, beautiful, exacting, rather than something that can be done glibly. You know, you, you remember all these people who offered courses in speed reading or how people would say that John F. Kennedy, part of his greatness as a president was that he could speed read a document and have the salient elements in his head when he walked into a meeting. But, but Joyce is kind of terrified of this idea that uh, mass literacy has, you know, produced a kind of willingness not to think hard about the fact that every word, every word really was once a poem, as Emerson said, but now we're just treating the words like garbage. Yeah, well, and you mentioned in your book, Ulysses and Us, you cite, I think, a few times um, the intellectual life of the British working class which I, I got that, I, I started reading it. It's, it's a bear of a book, so it's taking a while, but I, I got it because of, um, I was fascinated with the conclusions that you uh, cite in your book, Ulysses and Us. And, you know, it, it is amazing how you get this sense of pride in being able to grasp and understand and know um, high level literature among the working class. You know, it's almost as if it's a counter argument to what uh, D.H. Lawrence said about mass literacy. You actually found that um, the people wanted to be highly educated and it was a point of pride that they um, could access these very, what used to be very prolix and esoteric type stuff. They were, they were able to access it and it was a point of pride. And I'm almost... I mean, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm hopeful, but at, at least to me, that seem, it seems as if there is a capacity for people to rediscover the values of quiet, independent reading with the exacting silence of a text. And I think as we're in our current media diet, we're basically just on a, um, a rocket ship 
you know, reaching hyperspace. And many of us are just sort of along the ride, even people like me who somewhat resist it and find that I resist it by doing exacting reading. I think things are becoming so sensationalized and so just debilitatingly bright and hectic that I even find younger people like myself rediscovering the value of sort of taking a step back and really sitting with a book and not just reading a book, but living with a book. And um, I think Ulysses is really an instance where you don't read it, you live it and you live with it. Um, yes. you, you will read it the rest of your life and you will sort of practice your li life in parallel with a lot of the work that Joyce did in it. Yeah, in a way you don't just read it, it reads you. And that's what I meant by saying that the first time I inverted commas, perverted commas, read it, I found all this pacifism, which was a reasonable thing for me to find in the context of the British army murdering those civilians. But, you know, at other times in my life, after I got married, I found the androgyny in the book mysterious and beautiful. In, in a way, it's like how we used, you know, long playing records in, in those days, those great days of vinyl uh, music. And to, you, you, you would buy one of them and listen to it over and over and over and sit with your friends talking about, you know, what Bob Dylan might have meant on one track on Blonde on Blonde. So that in the end, it was reading and revealing you as well as you commenting on it. So all of that is, is one of the beautiful potentials of, of, of a reading or an interpreting culture. The problem I think that uh, was shown in that great book about the intellectual history of the English working class is that there was also a significant group, perhaps the majority group, which having achieved literacy, uh, wanted a much more middle brow, less thoughtful, or even low brow culture, and which, you know, went into libraries and snooped on people like Joyce and D.H. Lawrence to discover, you know, obscenity or a, a difficulty that was pornographic. And, and, you know, we know, for instance, that Lawrence's Lady Chatterley was put on trial and was only unbanned in England in the 1960s. Um, we know that here in Ireland, uh, the, the censorship was absolutely lethal. In, in Soviet Russia, it came from the top down. It was political. If the people in power didn't like a book, they just suppressed it like they did with Solzhenitsyn or Pasternak's Dr. Zhivago. But in Ireland, if just one person objected to a passage in a book, they could write a letter to the censors, who were basically five males mostly until re recent times, and say they thought this scene was, you know, suggestive of lesbianism or, you know, lavatorial in its humor. And more often than not, they could get the book banned. In other words, the, the existence and spread of mass literacy uh, created an inherent reaction against much of the great modernist texts uh, in the name of a kind of more banal middle brow culture for whom these objectors spoke. And that's the problem I think Lawrence identified when he said that in the long run, the fact that everyone can read will debase reading itself. Um, he himself became a victim of it in a way when his book was put on trial. And, and uh, th that is, I think, one of the problems uh, of the, you know, the technology of print itself. I mean, even going back to Luther, you know, that, that, that uh, there's a link between Protestantism and print and the idea, yes, of individual thought, but that can become groupthink very quickly and, and, and create its own lynch mobs in just the same way as the digital culture is now doing. So it seems to me that if, if we could almost read books, but in some way in the spirit of an oral culture that pre existed all this technology, we'd be doing you know, a better day's work. For instance, I would say an ideal way of reading Ulysses or Finnegan's Wake would be to lie on the floor, put the text projected onto the ceiling, which you can read as a text on the ceiling, 
and surround yourself with uh, stereophonic equipment that actually oralizes the text as well, you know, gives you a, 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 a spoken version of it. Because Joyce said, if you can't un understand something in any of my works, just try reading them aloud. And he does come out of an Ireland that was basically for most of its time, an oral culture. And as you said, the, the act of reading is a very recent development. And, uh, you know, <laughs> most people for most times in the world did not read texts. And you could even argue that many of the wars <laughs> that followed uh, Gutenberg, wars of religion especially, were textually based wars in which, you know, people got mad at each other because of what it said in books. And we see this today even in the clash between so-called Western civilization and the Islamic world or whatever. It's just amazing how many uh, rows are caused by uh, print. Yeah. Uh, even in the history of Ireland, uh, Colum Kill, one of our first saints, was, was exiled for copying a, a text and, and, and told he could not set foot on Ireland ever again. So I, I think, I think um, the power of literature is great, but it has a power to do immense harm or good. Yeah, well, it's, I mean, like any technology, I mean, I mean, literature is a technology, print is a technology, and any technology, I mean, given the fact that it can has mass, given the fact that it can have massive influence, I mean, it usually means that there's a darker side, sort of implicit and dormant inside it. And well, I, exactly, I once went into a class and I noticed that most of my students were using um, tablets or laptops. And I got immediately, I felt a bit insecure. I, I, I had said, this is just a banal example, that uh, the, the, the film of Mary Poppins by P.L. Travers was one of the first to combine uh, cartoonish scenes with actual human acting. And I was wrong, of course. One of my clever students was working away on the laptop and found there was a film in France in the late thirties that did the same. But, but, but um, I, I, then it made me think, um, well, everything seems to be a technology. Um, I went into that class and told them to stop using the tablets. And I think I was right because they were not giving attention to one another in the way they would if those tablets didn't intervene. They were not giving attention to the text and they were not giving attention to me in the, in the way that would have happened 40 years ago in a classroom without all this digital technology. But over 40 years ago, when I became a university student in Trinity College Dublin, actually it's over 50 years ago now, I remember my lecturer, Brendan Kennelly, um, looking up in depression at all these bent heads which were using pens and pencils to write down what he was saying. And he said, please stop, put down the pens, put down the pencils. If any of this is worth remembering, you'll remember it in two days time anyway. <laughs> yeah. And I told the students who were arguing with me about the laptops that the same problem was created by pens and pencils, you know, and he was just as right in a way to suggest they should not be used as I was to question the use of the the digital technology. Well, it's almost that it's almost a human universal that we will do what we can to try to escape the present moment. And we will use whatever is at hand to allow us to do that, whether it's, you know, pen um, and pencil or pen, pencil or paper, or it's laptops or tablets. I mean, I would argue that laptops are ta and tablets are several orders of magnitude more um, disruptive because the ability um, to leave, I guess, or to be in a place, a classroom in one sense, but not be there in an entirely other important sense is much more intense. I mean, you're, yeah. you're able to, act, you're able to like go to other places in a very real and direct way on yes. your tablet that you can't with your own, uh, with a pen and paper. Yeah, you're, um, never, you're never fully present in the moment. 
with, with a tablet. But equally, think about, say, me in 1969, writing down some brilliant thing Professor Kennelly had said. For instance, a point I've often used in my critiques of Ulysses, um, that the eccentric is simply the person with the deeper than average understanding of the normal. I remember writing that down because he said it and I thought it was brilliant. But I missed the next three sentences he said while I was writing that down, sure. if you know what I mean. Yeah. So in that sense, I was losing presence too, even as I got excited by an idea. Um, and I think that's the problem with all techni technologies, even pens and pencils, that, that you miss out on so much because experience has been rendered secondary or tertiary rather than primary. And you, 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 you lose more than you gain. Well, and I think with the part of the dream, utopian dream of technology is that we can sort of ensnare the present, but it, it is always sort of falling away from us as we try to catch up from it. We can't really achieve escape velocity from it. And, you know, in some sense, I mean, there's an argument in a fairly new school of philosophy that I follow, object-oriented ontology. And they have this concept of object with withdrawal. Mm. And it's basically how experience is always falling away from you at a rate at which you can never really hope to keep up, even if you have a supercomputer calculating all possible um, right. outcomes of a certain situation. And in some sense, I, I think that the um, a, a big sort of bad dynamic of technology is that it's... Um, it's indulging this fantasy that we have that we can um, that we can properly crystallize and keep and make a commodity or an object out of the present moment, which we can never fully grasp. We can only just sort of vibrate with, I guess, or get tuned into. And I think that this dovetails a lot with the themes of Ulysses, where the present moment, um, you know, there's a beautiful quote in Ulysses where it's just like be here in the present where I, I'm not I'm paraphrasing but where the the future plunges into the past you know and yeah. I think uh, Ulysses is kind of a, tr a a sort of a realignment training um, in the face of modernity yeah I, I think, think that's we could, true yeah. I think that's true and I think that's the reason why Joyce had separate hours for the separate episodes through the day he was in one way following the impressionist French painters who said, you know, I'm not just painting this tree, I'm painting it at a specific time of the day and how it looks in that moment because the tree will be shaken by the wind or lose some of its branches or whatever. Uh, that attempt to capture the immediacy of things was something Joyce was very insistent on. But you're so right. That phrase you just used has, is haunting me, you know, that experience falls away from us, even as we think we're embracing it. But that works both ways. For instance, um, so many young people now will have seen, say, say something as basic as kissing. Uh, so many young people now, you know, see kissing done hundreds of times in films before they are so inundated with desire that they actually kiss someone for whom they care. And by the time they get to do it, it's almost like a performative imitation of that which they have seen on the television or the film. Um, there's a sense in which experience doesn't just fall away, but it also precedes us to the actual moment, which should be deeply instantaneous, present, intense but which is always in a way, a kind of parody of something we've seen someone else do in what was itself a performance parodic form. And I, I, I mean, I, I've seen this even like when I was a young lecturer in the university in the way in which students kissed each other, they were copying some technique they had seen in a film, you know? And I, I think that's a, a huge problem you know, as I said, I use that phrase to be inundated with desire. It's, it's getting harder and harder to fuel that in a culture which is filled with all these, if you like, almost anticipatory echoes of experience, which is never the immediate experience. It's always the one 
someone else had are the one we will imitate, but never something that just overwhelms us and takes us by surprise. Sure. And well, and the only chance that we have of finding an experience that overwhelms us and takes us by surprise is if we're sort of in the um, in an environment that allows for spontaneity. And one thing that really troubles me about um, culture in general and how films and TV shows are being produced, especially by more and more hegemonic um, companies uh, like Disney, is that they they completely fall back on the concept that art is a risk. If, if, if a film is going to be a good film, it means that there was a risk taken and it paid off. Mm. Um, right now you see in the common culture, you see a complete, I mean, similar, I mean, they're, they're completely hedging their bets and they're hedging their bets to a point where it's, it's sort of sucking the air out of any merit that film would have otherwise had. They're taking the spontane spontaneity out of that experience. I mean, and so the cultural zone, which because of technology, younger people are spending more time in, um, in a sense, is very unspontaneous and very unorganic. It, it's everything that they're faced with has been sort of um, test run for maximum uh, desire juice extracted from it and then delivered in a convenient way. It's not that sort of organic and vague and misty um, process of direct experience that we get in an unfamiliar environment in an unfamiliar city where we don't really even know where we'll be sleeping tonight or what we should be eating or um, when the next tr next train comes um, that kind of experience um, is becoming squeezed out by these like I said curated experiences and I think it's it's leave is deranging us. It's leaving it's leading to a type of solipsism, which in Joyce's own way, he was addressing as they as that sort of solipsism system solipsism was manifesting itself in his own time, I think. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I think that um the uh you know, the lifetime of any genre or form is very short. You know, it's heroic period when risks are taken and people are surprising themselves, looking from behind a camera and suddenly realizing they can do this thing they didn't realize they could do. Uh, those kind of moments are few and far between. Um, but you must remember that one of the reasons Joyce is a great figure is that he wasn't James Joyce when he wrote the books. <laughs> mm -hmm. he wasn't James Joyce with a capital J perverted commas. You know, he he was surprising himself all the time, and and uh, the shape of that book Ulysses wasn't by any means predetermined. Even though he uses the Homeric grid as a basis to move the narrative forward, I mean, some of the more, if you like, testing or if you want, obscene later chapters are written in angry response to censorships of earlier chapters he had written. You know, like when they were intercepted in the American mails and, you know, denounced morally. And he said, you know, if they want, you know, a real challenge, I'll give it to them. You know, mm -hmm. he, he's surprised by their surprise at what he's doing. And he goes to places he would probably never have thought he was going to go uh, when he began the whole process. And I think that that capacity for risk, which of course is, allegedly one of capitalism's proudest boasts. You know, we are risk takers, we are entrepreneurs, we are heroic figures who try to do new things in order to generate vast amounts of capital. And um, there is an interesting sense in which there's an an analogy between the nobler elements of that and the risk taking of the artist. When Bloom sits down with Stephen at, near the end of the book, Bloom is a small time ad man and Stephen is a postgraduate student and poet. But Bloom makes the point to Stephen that he has as much right to earn money by his imagination, his poetry and his brain as, you know, the physical worker has to make money by their labor. And, and, and he, in fact, 
throws into question the distinction between Bohemian and bourgeois, which was common across Europe ever since the French Revolution. You know, you think of the great works of French literature through the 19th century, they're all based on a kind of an assumption of eternal war between the artist and the businessman. But that wasn't true in Ireland, the Ireland in which Joyce grew up, because we in Ireland had not yet had the capacity to develop a successful bourgeoisie. We, we did not have you know, wealth or affluence of any great degree. And in fact, Joyce was interested in business. He set up the first uh, um, cinema house in Dublin, uh, the Volta cinema, cinema. And he also tried to sell Irish tweed in uh, Trieste and so on. And I think he was aware that the artist and a certain kind of nobler businessman are brokers in risk, you know, that they do take huge chances. I mean, Stephen says in chapter three of Joyce's Ulysses, whoever anywhere will read these written words. When Joyce was writing in his cramped flat with two noisy kids and no space, and he had to write on, uh, he, he wore a very white clothing because he was semi-blind. You know, the odds against that project ever materializing were massive. And there is something beautifully heroic about his persistence over those years while World War I was unfolding and he was creating this epic that is not unlike the kind of lonely intensity that some of the people who create great businesses went through in the act of doing so. so I do think, um, you know, the trouble, I mean, the, the loss of risk in something like Disney is, is not just a tremendous um, barbarism committed against art, the art which film should represent. It's also a barbarism committed against the basic postulates of a proper business ethic, which would be based on risk and on trying something that is difficult because it's new and whose results are not guaranteed. The trouble with you know, most business now, as you say, including the film industry, is that all these products have been tested long before they're released to the public and there's nothing left to surprise us. Exactly, and it becomes that sort of anticipor anticipatory phantom of what experience is that in some sense degrades experience once we actually encounter it in real life. Um, and as you were speaking, I, I couldn't help but connect a parallel in my mind. I've been listening to a lot of Frank Zappa recently, and he's one instance where he was the artist as businessman. He was an artist as an entrepreneur. And he, he put out some of the most bizarre um, fascinating, um, groundbreaking music. And he kind of did it independently, very stubbornly independently, where, um, whereas many people at the time sort of were buying into this thing that Joyce picked up on with the Bohemian is how the Bohemian was staunchly against the bourgeois to a point where they were, they were kind of missing the point in a very interesting way. And they were in some sense, the poorer for it, um, yeah. both no, economically I mean, and figuratively, I guess. Yeah, I, I think the same about Bob Dylan. I mean, to me, Bob Dylan deserved the Nobel Prize for his cultural productions. Um, all my life, I've listened to his music and been mystified by it. I've mentioned Blonde on Blonde more than once to you already. And, you know, I had the same feeling I, with it that I had when I first read Ulysses. There were whole passages of it I didn't understand that seemed to be coming in from a planet yet undiscovered. And, um, you know, you slowly piece together the meanings like a child learning language and beginning to understand words by the words it doesn't understand become more comprehensible when put beside the words it does understand. And, uh, you know, Bob, Bob is a businessman too. He has been quite zealous in protecting his copyrights in selling them now in recent years. Um, but I wouldn't think of him as any less the artist for doing that. And Joyce was pretty similar. You know, he, he went around and he 
he, he narrated many of his intentions to Stuart Gilbert, especially the Homeric structure in that book, James Joyce's Ulysses. Then he went and he talked to the British painter, Frank Budgeon, and that great book, James Joyce and the Making of Ulysses, which has helped us all understand Ulysses better. Joyce was a good ad man. He wrote about an ad man, but he was also a, a, a zealous promoter of his own work in you know, an almost business-like way. And, and in fact, um, I have heard it said um, by the critic Adna Longley, uh, when she was once critical of Seamus Heaney, that he was too much allowed to create the conditions of his own reception in North America. Uh, which is to say in one way that he was just a very hardworking poet who gave a lot of readings in a lot of remote places in America and made sure that Americans understood what he was doing. You know, it might have sounded like a slight insult, but it's also a way of recognizing that, that all talented people work very hard to promote what it is they are making. And, um, you know, for that reason, I think one of the fascinations of Joyce's book is that the bourgeois and the bohemian make sweet music together at the end of it in ways that wouldn't have been possible in other works of European literature in that time or in the previous century. Um, and, 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 and that is also true of new forms for a while, like rock music. Um, I think in the end it got commodified. Um, just as perhaps one could say the, exper the experimental novel or experimental poem has been commodified through the later 20th century. But there is a kind of heroic period when people who are ambitious for material success are also willing to risk the fact that they may not enjoy it because what they're trying to do is so difficult and new. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that's probably just that's probably just a dynamic that we can't escape from. You're always going to have a sort of um, a sudden um, exhilarating burst of a new form onto a certain scene in a certain place that is sort of aligned with its own values and is very sort of authentic um, in its own right. You know, whether it's early punk music or early hip hop music or, rock music of course and then slowly and slowly as you see people gathering around the four uh, on the outlines of this these cultures and these movements people find oh if i could only adapt this to a larger audience there's a lot of be there's a lot of money yeah. to be made here yeah and, colonel parker <laughs> yeah and I, I mean one thing that just worries me about this new um these past few decades is that the the speed at which um, sort of rent seekers can digest a new movement is terrifying. Um, I mean, because, it, and I think that's another sort of perhaps downside of technology is that it's much harder for there to be a space with which a new genre of music or a movement in poetry um, can sort of allow can live and breathe in a, its own ecosystem before expiring and having the vultures pick them apart. Yeah, and, and there's a danger that entirely new forms of brilliance will be created, but not noticed. That's what mm -hmm. Joyce is asking, whoever will read these written words. There, there probably are great songs, great novels, great poems that we don't know anything about possibly in minority languages, which have not had the you know, spread they should have had. But it's very interesting. I think all the really interesting moments come out of transition. You know, when people who think of, you know, African-Americans taking up violins, violas, cellos, and making this strange new sound eventually called jazz, uh, that's like what the Irish did with the English language in the 19th century. They took this instrument, which was in some ways totally alien to their cultural tradition, but they made new musics out of it, you know, which helped to explain, say, the sirens music in Joyce um, or, 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 or whatever. And, and Adorno once said that, that the really great periods in art 
are always mo based on moments of latency. When one way of life is giving way to another and there's a brief period of blessed transition when newness is possible, um, but it doesn't last for very long. And, and, and you're right, the, the rentiers move in, but that would have been true even of say, you know, drama in the decades after Shakespeare. You know, that Shakespeare comes out of a certain set of energies and the bringing together of prior forms in an exciting new way, in the same way that Dylan did with music. Uh, but those days were gone by the 1630s, certainly by the 1640s when theatre was banned in London. Um, and, and I think, um, you know, Yeats once said this, uh, the, the days of great drama are few and they do not last for very long. Um, it, it probably is a sad inner truth about the arts that that kind of exhilaration doesn't last. You know, everything becomes imitative, copyist, and uh, it's hard to retain the original integrity. I mean, it's one of the reasons I admire Yeats that he kept changing in every decade. Um, he, 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 you know, people would complain even when he rewrote earlier poems and he would say, no, uh, it is myself that I remake. They do not know what is at stake. And in every decade of his life, he wrote a completely different kind of poetry in the same way that Dylan, I think, has changed a lot in his music and that Joyce did uh, in his writing. And that capacity to remain forever young, to, to have what Trotsky called permanent revolution in your writing or your art is a, a rare enough thing, you know. Um, I think that most uh, good poets, and I'm saying good poets, achieve at the age of 30, a kind of excellence and technical predictability that leaves them immune to criticism and also incapable of development. Mm. That even very good exponents of art forms get calcified very quickly in what, and they find this makes money or it, it gets me recognition, I'll keep on doing it. Uh, it is actually frightening to keep innovating or, or to be Bob Dylan and go in front of the audience and say, play fucking loud, yeah. having earlier been strumming the guitar. And then later go in front of the audience preaching all this Christian stuff that most of them probably hated. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and in the same way, I, I've often admired uh, the Beatles. I mean, their period of greatness, I suppose, was less than a decade, really but they never repeated themselves in any record within that decade. Each record did something totally different from the prior one, even though you could probably identify now, by now, characteristic Beatles sounds that groups like Oasis have produced minor echoes on. Nevertheless, I think that capacity to self-innovate is what we admire most in, in, in great art. Sure. Well, I mean, I was, I think another example to add on who, I mean, he's been a utter insp insp inspiration to me in many different mediums is David Bowie. I mean, that's where you oh, really yeah. see the, the total and utter overhaul of an entire image and an entire sound and an entire approach to music with almost every album. I mean, even the Ziggy Stardust albums have extremely deliberate and important differences among all of them. I mean, you can like, after the Spiders of Mars album, you know, you have um, a kind of a, a very, you have the persona, sure, but the sound and the approach uh, is totally different. And then you go in and I mean, but we even said at one point, he's like, what, what was I supposed to do? You honestly think, I mean, this was him talking when he was 60 years old. He's like, you honestly think I, I should still be dancing around with orange hair? You know, that would just, it would be almost ghoulish and weird and in a non, you know, in, in a very sad way. Um, yeah. it, it would be death. It'd be a, a kind of death um, worse than Ziggy dying at the end and uh, under his own terms, you know? And, and the greatness of Bowie is that he did what almost 
well, what most people consider is technically impossible. He narrated his own death, you know, yeah. in that last record. Um, this is, yeah, that, that's what Beckett did, you know, in, in Malone Dies. Um, yeah, he, he tried both to die and to capture the experience from within it as he was dying, which, of course, ultimately nobody can do in a finalized kind of way. But these artists gave us some sense of what it might be like to experience your own death, but narrate it as you were going through it. Um, that is such an awesome, um, audacious thing to do. For sure. And in some sense, I, I almost think, based off of what we've said earlier, that's kind of how new forms and new spontaneous art have the death implied in its own creation. In some yes. sense, all, all art is sort of narrating its own death. Yes, absolutely. The account, I mean, that's what I think Adorno meant by latency, that the account of the collapse of any civilization or any code becomes the master narrative of the next code that succeeds it. And Bowie and Beckett both understood that, that, you know, they were part of a tradition that would continue after them, but they were also trying a bit like the Gaelic bards, who, all, who one of whose conventions was to lie on the bed and say, look, I am dying. This is my final utterance. You know, Frank Sinatra says goodbye for the 25th time. Um, and, and the fact that they could narrate their own deaths with such gusto, it, it, it made people laugh and say, well, look, you can't really be all that dead or dying if you're able to speak with such articulate energy, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. but, but, but it is true that, that um, a lot of art is about codes dying and cultures dying. And then the account becomes the narrative, ma the master narrative of the next one. Um, I, I also think there's an element of mystery though that has to be retained in all these moments. I, I remember once reading in Bob Dylan's Chronicles, his response to Ulysses, the head of CBS Records gave him a present of one of the Shakespeare and Company copies as a reward for his cultural efforts for the company. And he read the book and he says in, in Chronicles, I could see this man was Lord of language, but what the hell he was trying to say, I could not figure out. And I said, Bob, stop projecting. That's you. That's just the way I felt when mm -hmm. I read you um, and when I read Ulysses. Uh, you know, it's like Eliot saying that great poetry communicates before it's understood. It's the same Eliot who said, I had to risk writing nonsense in order to write anything at all. This is what people like Bowie, Beckett, Eliot, Dylan, it's what they all have in common. The willingness not just to be brokers in risk, but lit literally to risk nonsense, I suppose. For sure. And... I mean, I think that also goes back to the efforts of, you know, taking Ulysses out of the hands of people who are um, obsessed with style and allegory and symbol collecting and plotting and charting and putting it back in the hands of people who are brokers in risk, yeah. who um, are sort of confronting the immediate um, in a very real way. I mean, that's what the book was written for. That's who the book was written for. Yeah. And it became a test in every country it passed through of the openness of the regime, the people, the interpretive community to take the risk. You know, Faulkner put it brilliantly once. He said, the only way to appro uh, approach James Joyce is with faith, which is what you bring to certain kinds of religion. You know, uh, you have to believe some absurd things just to get into it. And I remember when I was sent to China by the Irish government in 1993 for the launch of Ulysses in Mandarin. Um, the first night, there was about 30 people in the audience because the book was officially disapproved of by the Marxist regime for decades. The second night we had been on television. That meant we were approved by the regime and 500 professors turned up and students and one of the old professors said, I want to now apologize on, to James Joyce and his spirit 
and to my students past and present for incorrectly saying that Ulysses was a dung heap, uh, a bourgeois dung heap photographed through a microscope. And um, there was a Dublin critic friend of mine beside me and he said, Jesus Declan, no critic back in Dublin would ever admit that. <laughs> but the microphone was switched on, so everyone heard him say it, and they all burst out laughing, all these Chinese English speakers. Um, but it was interesting to me, because on that visit, a group of students approached me and said, will you come with us to view a temple? And I thought, good Lord, why would Chinese students on bicycles want a visiting Irish joy scholar to view a temple? But I did. And the reason they wanted was to tell me that the translation wasn't really very good, the one we were there to celebrate, that it had turned James Joyce back into Thomas Hardy. It had turned this experimental modernist masterpiece back into a linear 19th century novel with a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, and that there was somewhere else, a version that was much truer to, if you like, the chaos and randomness of Ulysses than the one we had in our hands as a celebration. And eventually the alternative one was published. And I think now is much more widely read in China. But this is interesting, you know, the way in which the, the very troubles about the book seem to test the tolerances of a culture. The couple who had translated the version we were celebrating were a very decent, nice elderly pair who had set their clock at 5 a.m. every morning to do this heroic work of translating a writer whose work they admired. Years earlier, they had translated Forster's Passage to India, and they actually had 60 letters from Forster explaining some of his aims in writing that book. But those letters were destroyed by the Red Guards during the Cultural Revolution. So they're just gone. And that couple was sent out to the fields for re-education, you know, to learn the ways of true Maoism. Now they were back working away on Joyce, an even bigger challenge than Forster. And I admired them. But damn it, the, the students on the bicycles told me <laughs> they, were, they were not bad people, but foolish because they thought that Ulysses could be turned into uh, <clears throat> a 19th century novel. I think that's the trouble with an awful lot of Joyce criticism, by the way, that it tries to render utterly comprehensible some moments which should remain mysterious. And in that process pretends that it's, you know, Thomas Hardy or William Thackeray. How do you think younger people are standing up to the test that Ulysses offers? Um, I'm not sure this is a great moment in that history, partly because so many young people have got caught up in woke culture mm. and whatever Ulysses is, is not woke. Um, it, 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 it would trouble the woke mind very deeply. And I think you and I have been in a classroom where that very problem arose, where some students found um, the chapter where Bloom masturbates as he's looking at the unveiled legs of Gertie McDowell. Their objections were not simply those of, if you like, a modern youth that is sexually, sees itself as radical, post-feminist in ways that have moved beyond Joyce, but also very old fashioned kind of objections. So, so, so the woke mind kind of gets harnessed to the sort of more narrow gauge Catholic mind that back in Ireland objected to Joyce at the time. And you have this problem then of, of people not really reading the book or wanting to, even people who thought they did at the beginning and signed up to do so. And I think that is a huge problem. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 I would imagine that if Joyce sent his book to a publisher now, it mightn't even see the light of day. We know how difficult he found it was to get it published. Do you think Lolita by Nabokov would be published now if it was sent to a publishing house? No, absolutely not. Yeah, and I mean, there's probably a lot of books of which that might be said, which are nevertheless in the canon with the capital C as in some sense classics. For sure. And it, what's so frustrating about it to me is like 
a lot of my peers that have subscribed to this are, especially in this example, particularly, they feel they get they feel as if they're on the vanguard of sexual politics, that they're pushing the boundaries and they're being radical. But at their at the same time, they're actually taking the the most reactionary position you can possibly take. Um, yeah. They're they're agreeing with the New York Society for the prevention of vice back yeah. when they banned Ulysses. And it's bizarre. They they sort of they get to indulge the censorious instinct, which um, all literary um, people of good merit, I I should say, should rebel against. And we have been trying to rebel against our own censorious instinct, um, and yet they're allowing themselves. They're indulging that instinct to censor. Um, and at the same time, they're justifying it as a, a sort of radical gesture when it couldn't be any further from the truth. And it, it is very disappointing. Well, I think that the critique of Joyce now comes mainly from a right wing Catholicism that was always unhappy with him, partly, I think, because he was a real Catholic who believed what the priests taught him and realized that for most of them, it was just a social convention rather than a real encounter with the risky you know, mm -hmm. nature of the divine. And then on the other hand, these pseudo radicals who, who, who have other objections. But the odd thing is the way in which the two groups meet at some point of intolerance. Let me give you a sort of separate, but I think utterly related example. Um, the censorship in Ireland was ferocious here in the 1940s, 50s, 60s. And as I said, if a citizen went into a library who was a taxpayer and objected to a passage in a book and wrote an objection to the censorship board, as like as not, the book would be banned. Now, the last book that was banned in a kind of controversial way was around about 1984, appropriately enough. And it was a book called The Joys of Sex. And the reason it was banned was <clears throat> It was one of the many books that were, you know, telling people what the joys of sex were. And in fact, the author had an Irish connection. But um, there was one uh, gr graphic in it. The book had many graphics, but there was one scene of mild bondage depicted. And this was objected to by conservative Christians, as you'll imagine, but, but also by radical feminists. So you get this unholy alliance of, in one way, the left and the right, uh, who actually, for a while, put the book out of circulation. Eventually it was readmitted and unbanned. But I found that a fascinating moment. And, you know, that's like a long time ago now, 1984, but it kind of predicted a lot of the problems you're hinting at now. Well, and for one of the reason why I think Joyce gets sex so right is that he doesn't he doesn't try to sublimate it into some sort of morally pure action you know and i think a lot of um a lot of the sort of deranging uh qualities that authentic sex has um in the minds of both uh uh radical liberals so so-called liberals and radical so-called conservatives is that it's almost as if they want uh, the dark and mysterious nature of sexuality to be um, amiable to a sort of moral paragon. And, you know, the, the, the conservatives, conservative Christians have their own moral paragon that they would like to see the mysterious and dark sexuality um, align with. And then, of course, the um, radical left on the other side has, has their own as well. And yeah. I think um, in Joyce, I mean, the treatment of sexuality in Joyce is fully respectful of the dark and utterly amoral aspects of sex. But at the same time, you see it even with that element, that darker element of that very primal um, aspect to humanity, Joyce still finds a way of authentically presenting it in parallel with a dignified and gentle and, as you say, pacifist uh, human being who's well-aligned and well-aligned because they're um, 
they've made peace with that mysterious element to themselves. And I, I think I, they I, need I to agree. do that. You know, yeah. <laughs> they need and, to read and, Ulysses. And also, I think he believed that there was an intimate link, you know, between sexuality and religion. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that um, Carl Jung, the psychologist, once said that whenever patients of his brought sexual problems to him, they often turned out to be religious in origin and vice versa. When someone had a, a, a religious problem, it often had a sexual underlay. And if you read through Ulysses, you can see the way Joyce explores that. You know, Bloom, for instance, when he is watching the old ladies take the communion in All Hallows Church, looks at it in one way through the eyes of an implied anthropologist. But, you know, he, he sees and describes the priest putting a thing on their tongue. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it's a completely sexualized uh, image. And there are so many like forms of that, as I said, particularly at the end, when, when Molly passes the seed cake, which is like a viaticum into Leopold's mouth. It is a sexual act, but it's also a religious act. And it's the act of a woman who thinks there ought to be women priests. So I've always felt that, that um, more conservative institutional Catholicism in Ireland always wanted to separate things, you know, the Bohemian and the bourgeois, drinking and eating, but also sex and religion. And Joyce is bringing all these things together, you know? For sure. Well, you could also say that um, the current manifestations of the radical left or wokeism in particular is preoccupied with a similar obsession with separation. Um, yeah. And I, I think that is why um, Ulysses is such a disturbing um, challenge um, repulsed to that is because it is a sort of bringing together of a lot of things, whether it's yeah. an, the androgyny of Leopold Bloom, or as you say, the, uh, the sec sexuality and religion, um, among other things. Um, yeah, I, I, and I think, you know, even though Ireland has a desperate history of censorship of literature, we never actually banned Ulysses. And one of the reasons was, I suppose, that no one could claim they understood it well enough to make a moral case mm -hmm. against it. It's, it's a bit like you probably couldn't have had anyone ban some of the rock music from the later 60s because they would have had to say how they understood it, you know? Yeah. Um, um, yet in America, you know that Ulysses was indeed banned and early, some of its chapters were seized in the mails as a prelude to the banning of the book. And equally in England, uh, the book was banned, and you, if, if you were F. R. Levis, the famous critic, and wanted to read it to find out what the hoo-ha was about, you had to make a special case to uh, government officials that you wanted to read it for entirely honourable literary critical reasons. Mm -hmm. But, but, but it, it has become, across the world in a way, a test of regimes and of their real as opposed to fake liberalism. For sure. And, for and sure. I, think, I think, for instance, um, you know, that time I studied Ulysses in the week when Bloody Sunday happened in Derry and all those unfortunate civilians were murdered by the soldiers. In those days, Ulysses was on pretty well every English department university course. And, it, you know, along with, you know, Elliot and Virginia Woolf, etc. Um, uh, and people were expected to at least begin an encounter with the book. Now, I mean, university departments usually have a single specialist, Joycean, who offers courses in the book to a very small segment of the student body. And I mean, this is separation with the vengeance, you know? This is the problem <clears throat> that, that Joycean's are seen as specialists and experts rather than as people who are interested in, as I called it, the book about everything. Mm -hmm. um, well, and it's, it's almost a, it's almost a more pernicious brand of separation as we were talking earlier on how 
conservatives would like to see certain things separated and how um, uh, leftists would like to see things separated. I mean, this is this goes to, I think, a, a current unfortunate trend in academia where um, perhaps because of certain corporate influences, you have the humanities is becoming increasingly more segmented specialty um, topics that can't really hear the other talking or doesn't even care to. Um, and I think that's why like Joyce, Joyce should, I mean, it's Ulysses, honestly, if, if you, um, Joyce famously said that you could rebuild Dublin just by using, uh, Ulysses, you could also rebuild much of Western literature as well. I mean, what other example do you have of a massive, uh, co like a massive meeting place of so many different literary, historical, philosophical, and religious influences, um, you know, coming together in this one um, full work. I mean, you would think that Ulysses would be a great place to start off, um, maybe not to start off, but at least as a place, um, or maybe as a place to end really a great books course, because it really is a sort of um, um, a bringing together of Western literature. Um, it, it's, yes. it's, yeah. and, and, and it's based on the idea that there is a common culture which every intelligent person can understand. Whether it's about, you know, how water gets from the reservoir to the domestic tap, or what the soliloquies in Hamlet actually mean, or, you know, uh, the nature of heroic self encounter, etc. Um, I mean, in order to read Ulysses, you do not need to be forbiddingly learned. You simply need to be the kind of person that was commonplace in 1922, uh, who, who came out of a primary and secondary education system and understood these things as shared elements in a common culture. But since then, you know, the, what I would call the bourgeoisie has been replaced by the consumerist middle class. And the idea that a university course in, say, literature encompasses a wide range of texts is replaced by all this specialism, which is just part of the whole cult of technical expertise, kind of particular knowledge that gains you money, etc. cetera. Um, another example, but it's, it may be banal, but it's a symbol of what's happening. You know, um, when I was a student in Trinity, Dublin, in 69 to 73. By the end of our fourth year, we had read every Shakespeare play except King John. And I, I went to King John in Stratford when I was a student in England and realized how boring it was, and why they didn't have it. But every other play we did. Now you can get a degree in Trinity College Dublin in English, an honors degree, without reading a single Shakespeare play. And I think that's a sign that the, the idea of a common culture has been despaired of even by some of its foremost, if you like, teachers, exponents. Um, <clears throat> you know, um, the world into which my father grew up and his father before him, which was Joyce's world basically, was one in which Shakespeare was not seen as some kind of elite imposition of the few on the few, but something that everyone should and could understand. I mean, there's a famous account of, uh, Anu McMaster, who was the head of a group of traveling actors, pulling into Limerick station in the train, pulling down the window and asking a passing porter, is this Limerick station? And the porter recognized him and said, why, sir, this is Illyria. You know, the passing porter could quote Shakespeare. And McMaster had another great story of when he was performing King Lear in Wicklow in a country uh, village fit up. And he liked to keep a certain distance for the mystique of the actor. But there was an old farmer hanging around who wouldn't disappear. He just wouldn't clear off. And eventually McMaster realized he'd have to talk to him. So the farmer came up to him and said, that King Lear was a mighty play, whichever of you has wrote it. <laughs> like the, the, the sense in which, you know, the people could understand these things at however rudimentary a level. All that's been lost and given up on, even within English departments. And I read just two days ago in the Daily Telegraph of London that the University of Sheffield has literally abolished its English department. There will no more be any English literature taught in the University of Sheffield in England. 
And you can be sure that this is the beginning of a trend that will rapidly exfoliate. There'll be, you know, five universities by the end of the next academic year, which aren't offering English in England, the land of Brexit, the land that believes in the greatness of English tradition, you know? Mm -hmm. We're in a real crisis at the moment, and, and, and Ulysses is a test case of it, but, you know, the crisis is much more general. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering what the future of it is. I mean, I'm, I'm going into academia very reluctantly. I mean, I, I've noticed a lot of these trends, and it was enough to scare me off from going into grad school um, right off the gate. Um, but I, I'm, I'm leaning more towards now just going in and seeing if the dialectic swings the other way, or if I can be a part of that. Um, and in some sense, I feel responsible to do so. Um, but yeah, it's a tricky situation. Of course, I think you should. And if people like you despair of it, it will become even more coarsened, more boring, more predictable in bad ways. But it's very hard to know what the future holds. When you think about it, over a hundred years ago, English literary studies, as I understand it and came through it in my lifetime, didn't really exist. Um, you know, people in Oxford and Cambridge who did the humanities tended to study Greek and Latin. And, and slowly the disciplinary study of English replaced it. And in one way it was both the, the the joy, but also the dismal fate of Ulysses to emerge at the same time as the curricular study of English, right? Mm -hmm. that, that, you know, Eliot, Joyce, Virginia Woolf became wonderful subjects for seminars in good English departments. And they were people who produced texts in which different voices went into contention with each other in exactly the kind of plural culture you're extolling. But, but again, it may have been a golden few decades that began to subside once the intolerances that associated themselves with this theory or that theory came to the fore in the 70s and 80s. And I, I wonder, like, I'm sure of classics professors in the 1890s and 1990s felt it was terrible, you know, that English was challenging the hegemony of their world. And we feel it's terrible now that people can't read Ulysses on an undergraduate course, but have to be specialist postgrads under the tutelage of a singular teacher. But, but, but the same thing is true. I, I loved Middlemarch by George Eliot, which Virginia Woolf said was the one novel in English in the 19th century really written for adults. It's just not taught now in most English departments because it's so bloody long. Look at Moby Dick, which is, you know, one of the great masterpieces of your culture, probably not studied in most English departments either because of the challenges it poses. And what strikes me about an awful lot of these texts is that they're not really novels at all. They're what Edward Mendelssohn once called encyclopedic narratives, or what I called in my recent collection, the book about everything. You know, part of their greatness is that they include so many voices in contrapuntal dispute with one another because that's the way the world is in its complexity and that's you know what these texts have in common with the odyssey of homer you know the 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 the, the fact that they 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 call for a kind of versatility of mind which is increasingly unfashionable for sure well and especially i mean because moby dick is one of my favorite books i mean uh, and certainly the homegrown version of Ulysses, and much like Ulysses is a kind of, as you say, a, a piece of art that finds itself on um, the decadent period of a certain epoch, um, much like how we've said how it sort of is narrating its own death. It's a form that's narrating its own death. Hmm. And, you know... Well, I always thought that about epic, uh, Mitch, in the sense that while classical scholars tended to think of epic as coming from a moment of confidence at the center of a successful culture, I always thought of it as the beginning of the death knell of the culture, you know, 
that, that Milton writes Paradise Lost, which is a great English epic, because of the failure of the English Revolution and because everything he loves and stands for is already in abeyance. And it's a kind of lament. And you could, in the same way, see Ulysses as a book that laments the end of the bourgeois as a culture. Uh, as I said, it was replaced by the merely consumerist middle class, which is something else entirely. But, but the reason that Bloom wears black is, of course, he's going to a funeral. But he doesn't know the guy whose death he, he's mourning. It may be that in a more general sense, his black suit stands for what Joyce thinks is happening to the bourgeois culture, which had its great moments, including the moments of risk taking business, but is now, in, you know, in, in retreat. And I think that's true of, of, you know, most epics. What we agreed earlier on, they do narrate the death of something or other. Uh, they don't come from a confident center in these cultures, they're actually uh, uh, about being on the periphery and just noticing the thing before it goes down, you know? Well, and, yeah, it doesn't even need to necessarily be an epic. I mean, cause I, I'm reminded all of a sudden that um, most of Plato was written sort of in hindsight um, in yes. the fall of Athenian culture. I mean, it was written after, not at the confident period of, um, of joy, you know, in that sense, as we say, it's a it's a strain at the heart of art that perhaps propels art to continue in a sense. And well, you know what uh, Yeats said, neither Christ nor Socrates nor Buddha wrote a book. <laughs> yeah. I mean, all these things are after the fact, even the life of Jesus, which I was praising as a dem democratic model for Joyce. Uh, yeah, they're all kind of belated and struggling to recapture the meaning of moments already disappearing and perhaps even lost already falling away yeah no you're right about that but um i i i i i, uh, I would i it's hard to know what will happen in universities um it, it seems to me that um the people who have taken away the common culture belong not just to my generation, but the one just before me, you know, the people who are 50 somethings. Um, I think a point will come when young people will just get pissed off with that denial and call for a return to something like the common study of great works of art. And it doesn't have to be the great books tradition because in a way what we've been extolling are encyclopedic narratives which are something different altogether from the great books tradition, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. but, but that could come back, I think, uh, simply because you can't fool young people for long. And uh, okay, they can fool themselves quite easily for a while. And a lot of them mean, are taught how to do so, you know, and they're given a vocabulary in graduate school that homogenizes everything and makes them think they have to present as specialists in three authors in order to get a job. But, you know, when I was a young academic, I, I could have been asked to lecture on anything from Tudor prose to post-feminist American poetry. You know, we were expected to do everything. Yeah, well, in, in some sense, I mean, even though I don't have, I mean, I've been having a lot of, different people comment on this, but I, I am in some sense hopeful that that is the case because I do find um, among younger people from those that I've met in Dublin, those that I met in Chicago, people that I've gone to college with, I do, there is, there's many people who are still sort of bewitched by the hyper-specialization bug. There's people who are still um, under that spell, but I think there's a lot more who just basically defect from the humanities and are sort of kind of autodidacts in their own sense, kind of by themselves. And they, they have a sort of respect of, you know, if only we could have a sort of 1920s Paris type model again, and maybe that's kind of how it will start is by yeah. people connecting and realizing that, yeah, no, there's, um, there's something more to these questions and, 
there's something there's something that's impoverished about the way universities are going about them. So it seems as if the only thing left to do is to just uh, put down the tablet and pay attention. Yeah, I agree. And also maybe maybe just as the modern generation was guilty of bringing to sex and perhaps to religion a greater pressure of expectation than either of these entities can bear. So also we have been guilty of fetishizing the university and expecting more of it than fallible human beings can deliver. That word you used, autodidact, is a beautiful word. You know, Joyce, I joked once, was a graduate of UCD and therefore an autodidact. <laughs> he actually attended very few of the rather mediocre classes that were made available to him at the time. And although he's now the proudest boast of University College Dublin, where I was honored to serve for more than three decades, the fact is that they tried again and again to fail him in many of his subjects because he was so unwilling to commit. Um, you could equally say that Melville was an autodidact, you know, that Shakespeare was an autodidact, that all the really great geniuses have to be self-taught. And therefore, it doesn't really matter in the end, although it's a pity if universities have become shrunken in their functions. Um, it would be better if they were more like they were 50 years ago. And I kind of lament the falling away because I've lived through it. And I worry sometimes if my generation contributed to it. But in the end, you're right. It just requires individual points of light and people who are willing to teach themselves and also listen closely to others, to pay attention, as I say, put down the tablet. And um, that'll always happen. And maybe universities will go through periods of decline and resurgence, which is actually the history of the institution going you know, right back to Paris and the medieval world. Uh, so we shouldn't maybe be overly disappointed if universities sometimes betray our hope. Sure. Well, we are coming on to two hours, and I do think that's a good place to end. Place to end. And I just want to thank you so much for meeting with me again. And um, is there anything, any sort of coda, anything left to say? Any advice that you would give to younger people? I I, I wouldn't presume to advise them just to say that I think young people are the signals we send into the future. Every time a baby is born, every time a student signs up for a course, someone is making an act of some kind of faith in the future. It has been a privilege for me to talk so often with you about these topics, and you are why I continue to hope, despite the badness of the times. Thank you so much for your company your attention, and also for giving me so many brilliant ideas to think about. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to like mm, cruise off the recording. Excellent. We'll talk yeah. again soon, I hope. Oh, please. And um, yeah, no, so I am.